name is Joel McMichael. I'm a seminarian for the Diocese of Tyler, Texas, and I'm born and raised in Tyler. I remember there being a time where I said verbatim, I will never be Catholic. There is nothing that could happen that would make me join the Catholic Church. And here I am now. Being in East Texas, there are churches everywhere, you know, and I was, my parents and I, my family, for as many generations as I know, we were Southern Baptist. You know, I looked at the reformers like Martin Luther, John Calvin especially, for me, was like a big guy. My dad was a big Calvin fan, and so he passed that on to me, and, you know, I was like, these guys are, I mean, they are reformers, they're heroes. And so I had all the classic stereotypes about Catholics. You know, they worship Mary. I might have, I might have even thought they like worshiped the Pope at some point. Whenever I was 16, I went on a mission trip, first time ever leaving the country. We went down to Belize. I think we were about halfway through the trip, and I don't know if it was sunrise or sunset. I know the sun was, the sky was kind of orangey, and I was sitting out on the second floor of this concrete hut. I was kind of looking over and I, you know, the jungle behind it. It was, it was all very dramatic. And I remember in that moment really having a sense of calling of, I want to give myself to serving the people of God. As a missionary, as a pastor, I don't know. There are a few Catholics at my public high school. One of those was Stephen Chavaria, one of our other seminarians. We were kind of pals, he was a class ahead of me. But I remember one time we went to a coffee shop and him and I and uh, Gabby, his girlfriend at the time, and his brother, and then some random like Church of Christ guy that he was friends with, we were all gonna get together and like debate. We're at a Starbucks in Barnes and Noble, you know, near Rice Road in Tyler. And, uh, and we're just going there, we're probably there for like two hours. And I remember some lady came up to us and was like, I just want to say, I just, I love that y'all are doing this. I used to do this kind of thing in high school. And, you know, and I was over here like, yeah, I'm going to convert this papist, you know, and um, I didn't do that at all. <laughs> going to my parents' alma mater, East Texas Baptist University in Marshall, Texas, I w went to study uh, scripture. I went to study the Bible and because um, I had hoped to be a missionary. It was kind of what I was going for. My junior year, um, I got to be really good friends with a guy who I'd kind of known in college. Um, you know, we'd kind of been acquaintances and he had graduated and was still living in Marshall working. And he was an Episcopalian mainline Episcopalian, and he started talking to me about Anglicanism, Episcopalianism, church history, and these sorts of things. And it was, a, it was good timing because at that time, I was taking a church history class. I was hearing stuff I'd never heard before. You know, I was like this, you know, why, why, why don't we talk about this, you know? At this point, per, per the, the class, per my friend Gavin, who's the Episcopalian, Gavin, I started uh, becoming higher church and, you know, becoming more and more Catholic without becoming Catholic. I just kind of, I kind of started realizing that I was having all these small intellectual conversions along the way. And one of those critical intellectual conversions that made me recognize that I need to make a change, that Anglicanism can't be the end, is, you know, I would go up and I'd, I'd receive at this Anglican church Holy Communion, and after this liturgy, thinking, you know, I'm going up to this and receiving this thing that I believe is, there's been a substantial change. Like, I, I believe in transubstantiation and that this is really Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity. But I'm going up to this, to this altar rail, and the guy on my right, he could think, oh, I'm just receiving Christ spiritually. The other guy could have, like, a Lutheran perspective. Gavin, my friend Gavin, the Anglican who brought me into all this at his suggestion, because I was so frustrated. I, I, I was having a lot of issues. I didn't know what to do. I, I couldn't take the plunge. And he said, Joel, you've had the intellectual conversion. 
you need to pray for a spiritual conversion. And he's like, you know, if you settle as an Anglican, great. If you feel like God's calling you to be a Catholic or Eastern Orthodox, that's great. But it's not going to happen if you don't pray about it. You've done all the thinking, stop thinking, start praying. And so that's what I started to do. I had this moment, it was a Friday night, and I was leaving work, and work had been miserable. And I was driving back home, and I, I just kind of, I really just kind of broke down. I was like, God, I don't know what to do. You know, Lord Jesus Christ, where are you? What are you asking me to do? What do you want me to do? Because I know that you, like, have a plan, but I don't see it. That was the first night that I, first time ever in my life that I turned to Our Lady for her help. And so I turned to her and I said, Mary, Mother of God, I don't really know what you do, but uh, I know that you point to your son Show me where he is. What is he calling me to? What does he want? And about the time that I got home, I felt Our Lady tell me, or ask me, rather, have you considered my son's church? And that's all I heard. But in her just saying my son's church, I knew in my soul, that she was talking about the Catholic Church. And I, I found that spiritual conversion I was looking for. I found it. When I told my parents that I was um, becoming Catholic, it did not go as poorly as it could have, but it also wasn't great. I take full responsibility that I think partly out of fear of what was gonna happen, I, I held off sharing that with them. I mean, they were speechless, literally speechless. And there was very few things said, and they were shocked. I gave them some time to cool down, came back a week later, and they sat down with me, and they, they both had written these, these letters that I still have, and they read them to me. And you know, it was, there was, yeah, there was stuff about like, oh well, X, Y, and Z are theological issues. Um, you know, that was more from my, from my dad, but what my mom had a lot of in hers was this reality of, um, we didn't see this coming. Where have you been? You, we felt distant from you. It, it, I did, it did leave my parents pretty raw, and um, I know they pray for me in their own way, and I visit them when I'm back home. You know, what I'm doing every day is I'm praying for them. I'm praying for their, one, their conversion towards virtue now um, in, in the way they're practicing their Christianity. But I mean, particularly, I, you know, I pray for their, their conversion to the Catholic faith. When I finally do get accepted into the church, it's August 23rd, 2019. I think the reason that I didn't have some emotional like breakdown when I received our Lord in the Eucharist wasn't because it wasn't meaningful. It was because it was the most necessary and most, most meaningful thing. Like, but also the most natural thing. Like, yeah, Joel, you're supposed to do this. I made you for communion. So now you've done it, keep doing it. The thing that was always on my mind was, how can I live a, a Eucharistic life? Which obviously all the faithful I think should strive for and the faithful can, uh, can attain that, you know, have a Eucharist centered life and they should. The, the mass, um, the Eucharist, the source and summit of our faith. But I, I knew that and I was pursuing that, but I was, I was like, I want that, but more. Pretty soon after I passed that one year mark, I was thinking maybe I should consider going to seminary. He gave me a missionary spirit when I was 16 years old. And if, if anybody thinks that mission work is just 
in some foreign country, um, they got it wrong. I believe, and maybe some will say that it's too optimistic, but I believe that people want to believe in the truth of the Eucharist. And for whatever reason, whether it be bad catechesis, parents that weren't there for them, harmful priests, the world being the primary influencer on people, the influence of Protestantism, whatever it is, I, I want to be a vessel and a tool for, for God to make small tweaks. Maybe I'll have to make some big tweaks. You know, I think he'll put me through the ringer. I want to be a part of going up to bat or getting in the mud or whatever analogy you want to use um, and contending, wrestling, and, and forbearing through those struggles with the people of God.